Evening, everyone. Evening. So, um, as the Conservatives have yet again given us more reasons to want them not just to lose, uh, but to lose incredibly badly. In fact, actually, ideally, to lose every seat they have. I thought we could just discuss the top reasons why we should want the, con the Conservatives completely destroyed. It'd be rude not to. It would be rude not to. I will just start off with a couple of little bits of, of, of uh, one unrelated news, but I noticed there were some comments, and yes, someone has just said, so the US House of Representatives has now voted quite by quite a margin, it's like 300 to 100 and something, to, um, to vote for the aid bill, which includes aid for Ukraine. The other thing, though, I wanted to just um, draw attention to. Where's it gone? Where have I got this? So I saw someone tweeting something, and they're usually quite reliable for things like this. <clears throat> To note, ahead of the local elections, which is the last set of elections before the general election, doesn't matter what happens, doesn't matter what the Tories do when they try to have the election, these local and mayoral elections are the last major, I mean, we could still have the odd by-election, but in terms of major elections. And it suggests here there's been a huge surge. There has been a campaign, you will notice, there's been a campaign specifically targeting young people to get them to register to vote for these elections, yes? Looks like it's been successful. Um, 113,000 applications were received on the deadline of the 16th of April from under 35s. Um, apparently, this is a 90% increase on 2021. I don't know about 2022 figures. But given that these local elect, I mean, the mayoral elections are already part are, are in there as well. And maybe it's because there's the mayoral elections. Maybe that's given it higher profile. Um, but 113,000 specifically under 35s. And remember, these elections are not everywhere. You know, they're not taking place. The only ones that are taking place anywhere are the PCCs. Uh, Alex just said they're hoping to sack my Tory PCC on 2nd of May. I mean, it, I mean, I think that's the one we all vote. I mean, I that's the only one I have this year. We had local elections last year here. There is no elected mayor uh, for my area. Um, so we have the PCC elections. I mean, I, I don't really agree with the position. I mean, I will turn up and just vote. I will I will vote for the donkey with the red rosette. I don't know them from Adam. Um, but... I, uh, you know, I don't really agree with that position. For me, the the, may, the, the local elections are important. Your local councillors are important. And the elected mayors are important. The PCCs are just... Um, I don't find them very accountable. I don't consider them all that accountable, really. So I think they just make a mess of things. Uh, but anyway... Uh, does is the, the light on the mugshot of Moggy uh, look like he's a Hitler toothbrush? No, I, I wouldn't have done that deliberately. Let's have a look. No, no, I think that's just oh, okay. It looks a bit weird. Um, yeah, maybe I I didn't do that deliberately. In all honesty, um, how do we boot the witches, Bradman and Patel out? So <laughs> tactical vote in the same way we boot all of them out. Um, it really is that simple. Like, no, if you look at the MRP polling, no concern, like, normally what you do is you look at the way uh, the, the results have panned out and you go, like with Boris Johnson at the last election, it was like, oh, but he got over 50% of the vote. So even if everyone else had combined their vote, we couldn't have ousted him, which there's a couple of things. First of all, remember, there's always loads of people who don't vote at all. So part of getting rid of these people is getting people who've never voted before or who don't usually vote to come out and vote. You know, getting them to come out and vote. But the other thing to note is this year, that's very different. It is possible. Obviously, MRP polling, you know, doesn't tell the whole picture. There's lots of unique local issues. But... It's actually possible that no Conservative candidate will win 50% of the vote, which means that if people do vote, and they don't have to vote, I'm not suggesting people have to vote tactically, far be it, but if people do want to destroy the Conservatives, voting tactically is the way to do it. 
the trick is who is the tactical vote and you know and i can point out stop the tories dot vote i know their methodology will be at least as good as anyone else's and better than most and you can be quite certain that they are not a secret tory um fake site set up either just check it out on the day you vote but tactical voting is the way to do it and and, and they're all vulnerable realistically i don't expect them i don't expect the tories to be actually wiped out at this election um the canada 1993 would be hilarious i don't see it quite happening the reason for which is that i there are a lot of seats where the tactical vote is not clear for people. It will be clear enough to people who are analysing the data. So if you go to, I mean, if you go to stopthetories.vote, you will find the best advice. But it won't. Not everyone will do that. So there will be some people trying to vote tactically who don't know which one is the right one to go for. Um, so the tactical vote in some seats will be split. But, I mean, Liz Truss, out of that picture, Jacob Rees-Mogg could be gone even without a lot of tactical voting. But at the same time, if you're in his neck of the woods, tactical voting, definitely there. Um, Liz Truss, now that you've got this uh, independent conservative group standing, she's very vulnerable. She is very vulnerable. Liz Truss could be gone as well. Boris Johnson is already gone. Uh, unless he decides he wants to stand for a seat in this election, but he's shown no signs that he does. Sweller Bravman and Rishi Sunak are in much safer seats, but again, they're not so safe that if... What you ideally need in those seats um, is a, a, a non-partisan campaign. Obviously, the individual parties will be, you know, sort of promoting themselves. You need a non-partisan group to say... This is the tactical vote in this area. That's really there. Uh, anything new from Labour about economic policy or housing? Uh, not new, new, no. I don't expect them to announce any new policies now at all. Until the man, I mean, even when the manifesto comes out, bearing like, so if you look up Labour list, Labour manifesto, there's an article they wrote last May, which, because they'd had a squiz at the manifesto. So what is actually... Now, some things will have changed, but I don't think anything will have been added. So basically, Labour's manifesto will be what was in that article. Um, it might just have had a few things removed or changed in the last year, because we know some things have. But I don't think there'll be anything new. So I don't think there are going to be any new policies. There, there won't be anything... The only surprises that will be in the manifesto, if there's any surprises at all is something we thought was a policy and has gone. But hopefully not too much of that. But I'll kick us off anyway. Reasons to destroy the toilet. So I was just thinking after Rishi Sunak's speech yesterday, where, because I'll tell you what particularly infuriated me. So it's the usual Tory thing. Like, they kick down, don't they? They tell the middle classes that, oh, the reason things aren't working for you, the reason your public services aren't working is because poor people are hogging it all, benefit scroungers, you know. And then what do they tell the poor people? Oh, it's the immigrants. So it's constantly kicking down, right? Um, and it's what they always do. So now they're attacking, you know, people who are too ill to work or people who have disabilities and just can't work, right? So they're attacking these people now and, and squeezing them when they've already been squeezed a hell of a lot. And you consider as well, so when... If you think about the state that Tories have left people in who are who have severe disabilities or serious illnesses and, and can't work because of it, they're not just squeezing these people by targeting welfare payments and saying, oh, well, maybe we should not pay you at all or pay you less or something like that. They're also squeezing them in. These people need these public services. For example, the people who are ill, if, if they can't get treatment for it, they're going to remain ill, aren't they? So... It's um, so it particularly infuriated me when later on that day, you've got like Jeremy Hunt or the tre someone from the Treasury basically going, we might we might get rid of we might cut stamp duty even more. And you think on the same day and because Rishi Sunak's justification, by the way, for targeting welfare 
the welfare budget is oh it just costs too much the usual thing costs too much and and then on the same day they're thinking about cutting more taxes for the rich because stamp duty is only pay you, you only pay any stamp duty at all on a on a primary home you you do pay it on second but i mean anyone who's got a second home sorry you're rich so go away you know but on your primary home that home has to be worth two hundred fifty thousand pounds before you pay anything and if you can afford that and i know some people say oh but you know in some parts of the country feel you know that's not even a very good home it's like we'll move somewhere else then but it's not you know it's not a reason to screw over people who are actually in need so in terms of benefit here's here are some benefits i would give for actually beating the tories into at least third place two straight off the bat i would say first of all so some people are not happy about the way labor phrase things or even certain policies now if i throw a policy straight out there um they now have a policy that they won't get rid of the two child limits on for child benefits right um now we know that's not a good policy we we know from experts that the single easiest way to alleviate child poverty is to get rid of that cap now that's not to say labor are going to leave children in poverty they have specific policies to raise people out of raise children but everyone but specifically children as well out of poverty it's just that clearly if they're going to maintain this policy they're going to do it in a less efficient way right so why would you do that why they would do it is because they had to counter the conservatives because there are a lot of voters who thinks to themselves, oh yeah, these people are just having children just so they can live a life of luxury or my tax dollar. Um, so, you know, and these are voters and these voters need to be attracted, right? And it's the same thing with their rhetoric. Someone, you know, was saying today about their rhetoric on, on the asylum issues. So Labour's focus in the mainstream media is on dealing with the criminal gangs, not, you know, putting asylum seekers in hotels, things like that. And, and you think, well, what about, you know, having safe routes? What about actually processing the claims? Labour have those policies. They're written down. They're on the website. They're all there. Yvette Cooper talks about them in Parliament. So, you know, they're not they're not secret policies. They just don't waste their time um, promoting them because the, the voters they're targeting aren't interested. Right. So but why do Labour have these rhetoric? Why do they have some of these policies? because they're countering the conservatives if the conservatives are destroyed as a political force they don't have to counter them who will labor be countering instead lib dems you know they'll, they'll be countering the lib dems and then some of those policies that we don't really like that they've had to do strategically all of a sudden they don't have to the other the another good reason for completely destroying them as well is it would send a message or it would hopefully send a message the if you look at what the conservatives are doing in this election year they're pushing cruel asylum policies cruel welfare policies they're not building schools and hospitals that they've allowed to fall down you know they they need punishing it, it what you want to be able to do after the election when they win about 30 seats and the Lib Dems are on 70 or 80 or something, you want to be able to turn around to any Conservative you come across and say, that's because you became the nasty party that Theresa May warned about. That is why that is. Uh, what do I think of a plan to remove child benefit for families earning £100,000 or more? Um, I don't know about specific. I don't want to ever comment on specific numbers. I'd rather experts worked out what sort of income people should be on um, and to get rid of it altogether. Um, like I, I am not so I'm not completely opposed to universal benefits like that because of, you know, for for political purposes, because people on one hundred thousand pounds collectively are still um still voters and and you know but at the same time in an ideal world if you didn't have to behave strategically you would make sure that any benefits are means tested um i mean if we look at labor's actual policies 
when we're... So these are the policies that were stated at the conference. So this is on welfare, by the way. If I go through Labour's policies specifically on welfare, you know, again, there's what you may have heard because you're reading it in the Tory press, and there's what Labour have actually... This is what they've actually committed to in the in the last conference. That's the last time they've ever mentioned any sort of new policies. So provide a reliable safety net for people who lose their jobs, including through large-scale redundancies and insolvency who cannot work due to ill health, disability or caring responsibilities. This safety net will continue to apply to those on legacy benefits too. Ensure that respect and dignity are once more at the heart of our social security system and that it works to tackle poverty and put an end to the soaring use of food banks. Work with campaigners and community groups to ensure food security for all. Reform and continually review the social security system to ensure that it tackles poverty and supports those hit hardest by the cost of living crisis. There's no mention here, by the way, that, that people in this position should be getting paid less so we could give rich people a tax break. Deliver fundamental reform of universal credit to tackle child poverty and offer a proper safety net. Ensure it makes work pay. Support people back to work. Allows people to live their lives in dignity and addresses inequalities across society. Overhaul the current unfair and punitive system and end punitive sanctions. That would be a huge one on its own. Examine whether the assessment period and payments are being delivered in a way that is responsive to changes in claimants' pay in recognition of the rise in zero-hour contracts. Um, consider, which is a weird one because they're going. <laughs> consider whether, but the idea that you don't have someone who's having to wait a ridiculous amount of time just because they were on benefits, then they had a bit of work and then it lasted hardly any time and then they were back. You know, sometimes it takes there's a long delay and it, like it doesn't just restart the benefit system. But anyway, in recognition of the uh, rise of zero hours contracts, consider whether split payments should be made the default to prevent domestic abuse and financial control. Recognize the importance of in-person appointments in supporting people to access the social security system, such as those without digital skills, because at the moment, it's like, oh, you've got to do this thing online. Well, what if you don't know how to do that or you don't have a smartphone or something? Oh, sorry, Tom. Make the rights to financial and employment support for the unemployed conditional on and balanced by responsibilities to look for work and take it up, which already exists now anyway. Offer tailored support, coaching and training opportunities. Make every stage of the social security system supportive and accessible. Fix the access to work scheme with improved targets for assessment, waiting times at reasonable timescales by giving people who are looking for work in principle indicative awards. A Labour Department for Work and Pensions will be committed to the social model of disability, not the medical model, and also incorporate principles of working with disabled people throughout policy processes often referred to as co-production. So that's Labour's actual policies. You won't have read about that in the Telegraph. Um, But there we go. Uh, my main concern about the future is the possibility we could end up with a far-right UKIP-esque opposition like reform of the Tories. So the the issue is, if the Conservative Party become or merges with, if in other words, the main right-wing party we have in this country is very far to the right, you have this huge vacuum, right? Now, some of those people who won't really like the new Conservative Party will still vote for them but an awful lot will be drawn to the Lib Dems. And that might mean that the Lib Dems tilt a little bit to the right as well, because they'll be getting... Because if you create that vacuum, inevitably the Lib Dems can suck an awful lot of voters from it. So that may mean that the Lib Dems... But the Lib Dems will at worst become sort of like the Democrats in America. Like, the Democrats are not a socialist party. They're, they're what you might consider a moderate conservative if you got rid of all the far right loonies in the conservative party you'd probably have what is basically like the democrat party in america you know cap or fundamentally capitalist a fundamentally capitalist ideology but with some social responsibility 
Uh, would the Labour Party ever plan to remove family credit, else known as the worst benefit ever created? So they, I mean, the plan originally was to completely get rid of universal credit. Now they're saying fundamentally reform it. Um, we don't know the details now. There's going to be a lot of things where we may see, I wouldn't expect a lot of detail in the manifesto either. They'll only offer details on things they have to. So some of it we'll have to wait and see. But in terms of their actual policies, these are the things we hold them to. And remember, whatever appears in the manifesto, Keir Starmer has gone to a lot of effort to make sure that they're certain they can deliver on it. Because clearly what he wants to do at the following election is to say, you point to me anything in the manifesto I didn't deliver. Oh, I delivered all of it. That's great. So now I'm going to present this hopefully bolder promise in the next manifesto. And you know I can deliver it because I've delivered the last one. And again, another good reason why we're talking about it to completely destroy the Conservative Party is to make it much easier to do so. Because consider the situation where you've got, if you have most of the power in power, I don't just mean, in the, obviously, Labour are going to have a majority that can pretty much do what they want. But wouldn't it be fantastic if you could have debates on, say, reform of universal credit, and you could have a debate amongst MPs on both sides of the House, which is fundamentally about how to do it best, not how to squeeze the poor and give tax breaks to the rich. If the Tories, if there was if there were only 30 of them, a few of them will pop up and say, oh, this is ridiculous, you're just giving money to the poor. But everyone else, the, the Liberal Democrats, the SNP, Plaid, if the Green Party win some MPs, them as well, will all be discussing the best way to support these people. Yes, Labour will get their way because they've got the majority. But wouldn't it be fantastic if you could have that debate and actually potentially end up with a situation where you have something that has real cross-party support? That would be a huge benefit. Uh, if the Lib Dems end up as the official opposition, how much do I think they would oppose bills that Labour bring to Parliament? Also, which policies they most like to argue against? It is a very interesting question because the, on the one hand, I mean, I've just literally said there'll be a lot more, there'll be a more constructive attitude towards um, presenting legislation to Parliament. At the same time, it will be interesting because I could say on the one hand, in order for the Lib Dems to be seen as the main opposition and therefore the credible alternative to Labour in time, they have to oppose Labour. Now, there will be some things. They could, for example, um, again, it depends. If you create this vacuum where there's those sort of more right wing voters, do they become, do they go, do they criticise the housing policies more? You know, is that one where the Lib Dems could draw a distinction with Labour on housing policy? That's what I would imagine. I'm not sure they do too much on healthcare or education but I can see housing policy being possible obviously everyone has their own ideas about how best to run the economy so they'll always be able to argue against the budget they'll come up with some criticism of the budget every single time inevitably so I think the Lib Dems will have opportunities but what's going to be really interesting is in order for the Lib Dems to solidify their position again we're, we're, this is blue sky thinking you know this is all there's a lot of ifs here in order for them to solidify their position as the main opposition at the following election they won't actually still be competing with labor and even though they'll be wanting to take a lot of labor seats these will be labor seats that labor can't really hold on to with the first past the post system anyway another thing that the lib dems although i'm hoping this won't be really drawing a distinction with labor they could really get behind electoral reform you know, they could really push very hard on that. Um, but I am hoping that's not going to be antagonistic with Labour. Uh, don't give me too much hope. Well, I mean, all people have to do, like, it's in people's hands. This is like no election I've ever experienced in this country. The Conservatives have, it's like they've got everything wrong. 
absolutely you know this is people it's too easy to say this is the result of 14 years of a conservative government it's like no you know we had 13 years of a conservative government in 1992 and people still voted for the conservatives it's not simply a result of a bit over a dozen years of a conservative government it's because they've completely trashed everything everything you know brexit has complete has it has stopped them being able to face up to reality what we have here is a conservative party that cannot face reality because brexit prevents it doing so if if the conservatives elect a leader who is practical and strategic they cannot go along with the hard brexit it's impossible it's absolutely you can have the rhetoric don't get me wrong a practical and strategic leader can can you know much like starmer's doing can use rhetoric that suggests that they're on the crazy side but their actual policies cannot be in in line with a hard brexit even rishi sunak is trying to be pragmatic with brexit he just got very little room for maneuver uh, how can the Lib Dems differentiate themselves from the Tories when they themselves are differentiating themselves from Labour? Defo don't need a Tory 2.0 party. No, but I'm just, again, if we if we imagine this scenario for, pans out, you have to think about those voters on the right wing. You think about where they go. Um, and the the only thing that stops them going back to the Conservative Party is because put it this way the reason one of the reasons why the tories have a very good chance of being completely destroyed at this this election is a lot of conservative voters staying home and not voting at all right because there's going to be a large number of voters who they they won't vote labor they really won't vote labor but they cannot bring themselves to vote for the conservatives they cannot vote for this mess they know it's a mess they know the conservatives are getting it wrong they know it's not external issues Yes, COVID, yes, war in Europe. They know about that. They know that that is fundamentally not what's going wrong here. Um, and they cannot vote for this shambles, right? But in the following election, they will probably vote again. So who do they vote for? And, and you know, if you want them to vote for the Lib Dems, then the Lib Dems are going to have to appeal to them. And that probably means the Lib Dems are going to have to shift a bit. Um in order to attract them it's really that simple so in so what you actually do effectively need to because there's not going to be a situation where there is no right-wing party because that's too many right-wing voters <laughs> yeah although you know the median voter in this country is slightly center left unfortunately that doesn't help very much because there's so many parties vying for their votes there are still a lot of right-wing voters and there's also a fair number of authoritarian voters, authoritarian left wing. Now, they can be split. You know, it depends on what they prioritize, their left wing economic ideas or their authoritarian social ideas. Um, but, yeah, if, if you want to destroy the conservatives, like if they're beaten down to 30 seats and the Lib Dems do not try to win those, because, again, there's going to be a huge pool of untapped right wing voters for the next election and if the Lib Dems don't chase after them the Tories will and and the Tories will come straight back again you know even if the Tories were beaten down to 20 MPs they could still come roaring back because they'll have the money behind them they could still come roaring back if those voters are up for grabs so you have to take the voters off them Labour can't take the voters off them so there's only the Lib Dems that, well there's only the Lib Dems and Reform UK but I, I again I'd be very surprised if Reform UK genuinely are trying to become a long-term political party i just see them as like um you know like a brain worm for the conservative party they're just there to to change their dna and then bugger off uh, my big worry is if the tories approached reform and did a deal that they couldn't refuse to merge tory reform is nothing new but it would be in election year for labor i'm i'm i don't think there will be a deal with reform you can't rule it out of course you can't rule it out i think the biggest uh danger is not reform uk doing a deal with the tories i think it's reform uk just not being able to stand candidates because they're they're you know they're 
assigning candidates, then they're having to sack. They've sacked about half of them or something, or a fair number. It's about 70 odd now, I think. Because they attract. It's not just that they attract racists and xenophobes and big other various flavors of bigot. It's that they attract the sort of people who don't understand that these views can't be aired publicly. They think they're fine. They think they're mainstream. You know, and so they can't. I don't. Yeah, they, they, they're struggling, but I don't think they'll come to a deal. And the reason I will say that is because what's the benefit to Reform UK? Even if the Tories agreed to let Richard Tice himself write their manifesto, which they won't. What's the benefit to Reform UK? Because the Tories will still lose. Remember, ref although Reform UK would like to suggest such, they're not kingmakers in this election. They're just the difference between the Tories getting pounded and getting obliterated, right? That's it. They're just part of that. Um, they could end up being the difference between the Tories being in second or third place. That's it. They're not going to determine who's the government. So if Reform UK did a deal and stood candidates down, then first of all, who will, because that'll be two elections in a row, who will trust them in the third election? So they might as well just pack up and go home. And and secondly, it will do, it'll do no good. At the last election, when as the Brexit passed, they did it, it helped. It actually got Brexit. It got them it got the UK out of the EU. If they hadn't have stood those candidates down, that wouldn't have happened. So they got something that they wanted, whereas at this election, they can't possibly get anything they want. Because whatever the Tories put in their manifesto is going to be beaten and beaten badly to the point where it will be difficult, or put it this way, any Conservative MPs left who argue that these policies were responsible for the loss will have a lot of ammunition. So now it's in Reform UK's interest to actually help crush the Tories at this election so that they can say that the Tories cannot win while Reform UK are about to force the Tories further to the right. Even then, it's still a tricky prospect for them. It's not easy because there will be some Conservatives who recognise that tilting too far to the right means you're just losing those voters. Those voters are going to split themselves between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. You know, you, you know, if the Tories keep tilting... At the moment, there's a huge amount of no-man's land on the right wing in, in what you might call the sort of moderate right wing. Around the centre, you've got the Lib Dems and you've got Labour carrying out the odd incursion. And, and then you've got this huge area of no man's land and then you've got the Conservative Party and Reform UK. Because the Conservative Party are not very different to Reform UK, are they, really? The, the policies differ in terms of how they intend to do things because Reform UK can be utterly crazy with their suggestions. But their outcomes are the same. What, you know, can anyone think of any outcome that is, that, that is different between Reform UK and the Conservative Party right now? I, I can't think of any. Uh, remember when the Tories had the Monday Club, one of the most racist factions in politics? They, they've always had these people because people on the extreme wings of politics, some of them are, are just blindly extremist and they will form fringe groups um, because they refuse to compromise. And some of them are pragmatic and they go, well, yeah, but we can't actually achieve anything with our, our tiny little club. So they have to join the big boys. So that's what they do. So, yeah, the Conservative Party have always had these. Uh, the Labour Party have always had extremists as well, although they, they at least have people's interests at heart. Uh, if Braverman became Tory leader, I think a deal is more likely. No, I, I, right, strategically, I mean, she's not going to. But strategically, it makes no sense for Reform UK to do a deal. The, 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 what I would have done, what I would have thought made sense for Reform UK, if there's to be a deal, not a deal with the Conservative Party, what they could have done, and what they still could do, but they'd now be breaking their word, but what they could have done right from the start is to say, we won't stand a candidate everywhere, we will only stand candidates 
where we do not approve of the candidate offer. That would have given them space, for example, to not stand against Liz Truss, Swella Bravman, Priti Patel, and people like this, right? So they actually could have helped those. They, you know, they, I would just think, you know, Reform UK strategically would do themselves a lot of favours by having, um, by increasing the number of far-right Tory MPs. And they can do that by standing down in seats contested by people they approve of. And that would also free up the number of candidates they need to find as well. So I have no idea why reform... I mean, I suppose in theory they could still do that at the end. But, you know, given that they Richard Tice has insisted that he's not going to do that, it, the longer he does that, the, 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 the more likely it is he looks dishonest if he suddenly changes his mind, right? So, anyway... Uh, why would Labour reject the EU offer of uh, free movement for young people? Gammon votes only minority now. They haven't. They've um, they've sounded sceptical about it. They haven't ruled it out. The Conservatives have ruled it out. Labour haven't, unless I've missed something. Uh, they certainly shouldn't because it's identical to a policy they already have, just for different people. And given that this is on offer, it'd be mad. So all... I. I Unless they've literally said something today that I've missed, the, the position last week was, oh, we're not sure about this. It sounds like freedom of movement. That is not a yes or a no. That is a we don't want to say anything about Brexit before the election. Uh, incredible the parties with the names Conservative and Reform seem to have fundamentally the same goals. Yeah, but, you you, you know, these things... Are um, you always hide the lie in the name, don't you? It's like the, the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, and it's like it's not democratic, it's not for the people, it's not a republic. It is in Korea, though, so 25% of the name of that country. Similar thing with Democratic Republic of Congo, same thing, you know. So, you hide the lie in the name, don't you? Um, electoral calculus shows a close Labour win with Lib Dems a very poor third but no oh I, is it who's this oh, is this for Bravman's seat I'd be um, I, I'm just gonna I think they have changed their model but I haven't checked it out really since what I would say is with electoral calculus given that we are now starting to get full MRP polls from YouGov I would tend to lean a little bit more into that than electoral calculus is. Um, that's what I would advise. I'm not saying, you know, you treat any as gospel. Electoral calculus have had a few issues. Uh, I know that they keep refining it. They're not idiots. Um, but I would just be a little bit, a little bit sceptical. I would, I would tend to lean on the YouGov MRP poll a bit more. And even then, consider local issues. Um, but there we go. Uh, James Clever is a good example of a lie in the name. Well, it, to be fair, it wasn't a lie. Um, the parents didn't know he was going to be stupid when they gave him his name. And indeed, he didn't have to be stupid. He's decided to... Again, I think there's a lot of Conservatives who've had to now adopt this position. They've had to let their brain turn to jelly because it is the only way to survive in the Conservative Party. You, James Cleverly, last week, um, was talking absolute crap about the Rwanda policy. And he knows it's crap. He knows it. Doing it anyway. Because, as I say, you know, there are people in the Conservative Party who are genuinely insane. They actually think this free market capitalism, um, you know, this, this crushing the hell out of individual people, this elitism that they have, they think it can work. They think it can work and build a stable society. It can't, but they're crazy enough to think it can. But there's a whole load of them. No, it can't. They're just hanging on to the coattails. They're just trying to stay on the gravy train. That's all it's about.
Uh, MRP says Labour would win Tor, but they have no councillors there, no chance. Um, um, when did Torbay last go to the locals, though? Do consider, I don't know, I'd have to look into Torbay specifically, but what I would say is do consider that if the local elections were a few years ago, things have very much changed. And also, there are, local elections can be instructive in some ways, but also people vote along very different lines in a local election as well. Much fewer people voting. You've got to consider there's about a third, maybe a half at most of, the. if you think about the number of people who are going to vote in the general election, fewer than half of those people vote in local elections. And therefore, there's a large of the people who, and it's not homogenous either. It's not just evenly split. It's very different types of voter. The types of voter who go along and vote in a local election are very, very different to the ones who will vote in a general election, but not a local election. So you do have to be a little bit. Oh, it's in 2023. Okay, well, that's maybe a bit more uh, serious then. But again, we will see. I'll tell you what's going to be really fascinating. And that is just to see what happens in the general election. I am now really curious about the general election results. Not just the fact that we will no longer have a Conservative government. I, I'm going to be spending a long time looking over the results. Uh, Clever did say one smart thing. Once work is what you do, not where you are. He's uh, quite a few times when he's allowed to actually just take a sensible line. He is actually quite sensible in many ways. He is still a conservative. Um, and a Brexiteer. He is a genuine Brexiteer. But, you know, when he's allowed to, he can be vaguely sensible on some issues. It's just, you know, he, he prioritises his own personal ambition over being sensible. Hence the statements he's come out with the Rwanda plan. <laughs> uh, will EU governments breathe a sigh of relief after the general election or will it be a case of... Nah. I think somewhere in between. You know, um, inevitably it's going to be a lot easier to deal with the UK with uh, a competent and sensible and pragmatic government. And it helps that it will also be a pro-EU government. But... At the same time, we're not their biggest problem. We are part of solutions to some of their biggest problems, though. But at the same time, they've got a lot of other stuff to be dealing with. And the thing is, as well, if you think about Europe as a whole, like, you know, sometimes people talk about, oh, there's a swing away from this and a swing towards this. Like, you know, so a few years ago, people were thinking, oh, there's a swing away from authoritarianism because Trump lost and Bolsonaro lost and... And you were thinking, oh, maybe this is... And it's like, no. Because then, since then, we've had Italy and Argentina go the other way. You know, and it's what if you just look at the world, what happens is governments fall. And if you've got a right-wing authoritarian government in and it falls, it's like, oh, maybe there's going to be a change. There's never a change. Governments just fall. They're in power for a while and then they fall. And, and the same thing happens in Europe all the time. You know, they may breathe a sigh of relief that the UK gets a sensible government again. But Italy's just got a crap government. Hungary's got a crap government. You know, so there's always, there always seems to be a, a reasonable balance of crap and sensible governments. I wonder what I think of Rory Stewart. Don't shoot me, I quite like him. Um, I, I Again, on a personal level, I have no idea, but he is still a Conservative. And, you know, he it's not just that he joined the Conservative Party. He Even in the election, that leadership election contest, where he had no hope of winning. All he, so he could be as honest as he liked. And yet he still talked about the need to leave the EU. Right. Really. So, you know, it was... Yeah, um, I mean, that's my attitude to him. He may well be fine talking about something that's not politics, but I won't get on with him talking about politics.
Uh, MRP grossly overestimates Labour in the Southwest. Well, we'll see. Because I will just point out, bear in mind that people, again, this is a by-election, so again, not always the same people who vote in the general election. But people would have said the same thing, not quite, the, not quite that extreme, but the same thing of mid-Bedfordshire, wouldn't they? And Labour won that. So you, it may be right. And MRP, because it can't always take account of some local issues, there will be some. I don't believe it's getting it badly wrong in a whole region of the country, though. Um, but in individual places, sure, yes. Uh, which is why tactical voting sites don't just lean on MRP polls. There's other things as well that factor into their thinking. But I will just say I think it will be very interesting to see the results. Uh, what are the odds that Sunak will keep his seat? Took over from Haig and, and Richmond was supposed to be as blue as they come. Yeah, um, he's, he does stand a good chance. But if there was a... And the reason I'll say that is because I'm not aware of a... Like, if there was a real good... If there was a local camp tactical voting campaign there, I would be thinking Rishi Sunak could be in a lot of trouble. Um, the fact that we'll be... Because there's two types of, like tactical voting campaign that's going to be going on there's the national tactical voting campaign there'll be various groups doing that but there'll be groups who are who are campaigning nationally to get people to to vote tactically and then there'll be individual non-partisan groups doing so in in local areas so the best way to get rid of a tory from what has been a safe seat is to have both of them and as far as i know I'm not aware, anyway, of any group in Richmond that is pushing this tactical voting. I know that there are some in some constituencies, but I'm not aware of any in Richmond. So, um, yeah, he's still probably quite likely to retain his seat. But I don't think it'll be by a lot. I, I think it'll be a bit squeaky bum. So we could lose it. And actually, if they delay the election until after summer, I mean, who knows? We'll have to see which way the polls still go, but who knows indeed. The other thing as well to bear in mind with Rishi Sunak, because he's the Prime Minister, for local voters there who are minded to vote tactically against the Tories, if they're willing to do that, there's a real prize on offer. Because, I think I'm right in saying this, I don't think a sitting Prime Minister has ever lost their seat in a general election. So the people there have a real chance to make history, to draw attention to themselves. And again, it helps send that message, doesn't it? If even your own leader in a really safe seat is not safe, it's a lesson to take voters seriously. You know, that is, again, that has got to be the biggest, even for people who don't want the Conservative Party permanently destroyed, just, you know, the being able to send them a message that they cannot take voters for granted, because they have been. In a major way, they've been taking voters for granted. Because if you look at all the top issues, that even, con and I mean conservative votes, I don't mean majority, we're not in them, we don't, we have first past the post, majority opinion matters nothing. Even when you look at polling just by conservative voters, Rishi Sunak is doing nothing, nothing to address any of them, right? He's even got them thinking that asylum and immigration is a top issue, and yet what's he doing about it? He's making it worse. You know, in terms of to try and get immigration numbers down, he's targeting the people who basically come over and either do the jobs we cannot fill, like in care work or the NHS, or come over to give us a load of money and then disappear, like foreign students. Like, a, like I cannot get it through to enough people. A student visa is just that. It, it doesn't allow you to come and settle. It comes it while you're a student. If you're no longer a student, if you leave the course or whatever, your your visa will be revoked. It's it, you know it's only for when you're a student. So they're coming here and spending a load of money. So 
you know, restricting access to this is madness. Absolute madness. That's not helping immigration. That's harming it. Uh, Wanga Payne said, I listened to Ed Miliband's book, Big, and from it I gather he's actually quite radical in his thinking. Do I agree? And who else in Labour's front bench would I say is like him in thinking? A lot of them are. I mean, a lot, a lot. To, I mean, to rise to the top in politics, you do have to be very ambitious. And you will find that a lot of them are. It doesn't necessarily mean that you will get major reforms because it doesn't matter what politicians personally think. What matters is what the public want them to do. And mostly what the public want them to do is things that aren't scary. So if we're going to hope for major reforms, they're actually going to have to take place very slowly. You know, it's like we talk about the frog in the boiling pot um, purely in negative terms. How the Tories squeezed people's living standards slowly over a period of time. The reason why they're suffering so much now in the polls is because over the last few years that that squeeze, that, that raising of the temperature was very rapid. But up until COVID, it was quite gradual. I don't want to use the word gentle because it was anything but. But it was quite gradual to the point where a lot, a lot of people noticed it. All of a sudden, over the last few years, that you know the temperature has been racked, whacked up and people notice. And that's why Sunak is not going to get any benefit from falling inflation or falling interest rates because... People can now, re they can't remember what their standard of living was like 10 years ago, but they can remember two years ago. And because they've had about 10 years worth of living standard squeeze in two or three years, people now remember. But it can be a positive as well. You can introduce reform slowly so that people don't notice and get scared by it. A little adjustment here, a little adjustment there. And you can have a 10 year plan that gets you into a very different place with lots of minor adjustments that don't scare people. Because that ultimately is it. You, you need to, you can't afford to have a lot of, because there's a lot of people are sort of comfortable, even now, even with the country as it is, a lot of people are comfortable. They can live like this. And they don't like the sound of something that can upset their place in the order of things. Uh, Rishi thinks one is a prime number. He didn't say that, did he? He's got maths qualification, surely not. Uh, where streeting concerns me, he keeps on mentioning private outsourcing for the NHS. No, he doesn't. He doesn't ever mention private outsourcing. That is dead against policy. What he talks about is private provision to deal with um, the backlog. But Labour's formal policy is a massive amount of insourcing. Out... Consider the difference, and I, I need people to understand the difference between using the private sector for something and privatization or outsourcing. Outsourcing is when you take something that's currently been delivered in house and you you give it to, uh, or could be delivered in house, shall we say, and give it to a private company, right? Whereas what they're talking about, the waiting list, the NHS does not have the capacity to deal with that. So what he's talking about is using the private sector for that. Now, there are still dangers with that. I mean, I was discussing some of them with a fella from um, We Own It. But at the same time, we've got, we're, we're going to inherit waiting lists of about 8 million people. And we can't just leave them. We're going to have to do something uh, to get those waiting lists down quite, quite spectacularly when we simply do not have enough doctors or nurses in the NHS. You know, we can build, I mean, it take, it'll take time to even get the buildings back up, but we can build and we can pay for, all of this just needs money, beds, hospital buildings, all of it just needs money. But doctors and nurses, no amount of money just conjures those up. Even if we were to pay uh, an attractive rate of pay again, you can't just magic up all the doctors and nurses we need because it's like in any workplace, you need a steady flow of people coming in so that they can be mentored. You can't suddenly double, oh, I mean, not that it would be double, but you can't suddenly like double the number of new employees into a system. Can't cope with it. It'll be disaster. Say Phil also hates Wes. That's, that's I, I wouldn't use that word. I don't actually hate very many people. And I don't think I ever express hatred of people. 
I, I'm, I'm not a fan of his. I don't hate him. Um, I don't think I hate anyone in Labour. I, I, I really try to avoid. Say one and two are prime numbers though. No. Two is a prime number, one is not. A prime number is defined as being a number which has exactly two factors, one and itself. One, the number one only has one factor because one is itself, so it's not prime. So two is the smallest prime number. But anyway, uh, do the Tories throw money at private healthcare irrespective of whether they're actually tended to patients? Yes, because the Tory, I mean, there's two things with the Tories. First of all, a lot of them make money personally from these contracts but there's an extent to which it's not even just self-interest they have an ideological belief in the private sector just like there are socialists who have an ideological belief in the state sector uh, like state production for everything like you know we call them communists right and it's a lovely thought it just doesn't work in my view so there are things where i wouldn't want the states to be deciding it i want the states to run essential services. So I would say some. I'd be in favour of the state running some manufacture, for example, steel. Um, but by and large, manufacture, I think, works fine in the private sector. But services, public services, should be in the public sector. Um, but you have some people who just think that everything, every, the state should actually manage all means of production, which is you know, communism. Um, and to the point where even if, if they get the opportunity to try it out, it doesn't work. They persist with it anyway because of they'll never review their their ideas because they have that ideological zeal. And it's the same on the right. It's just that in this country, the right way, well, most countries, the right wing find it much easier to test their ideas out than the left wing because, well, they have all the money, you see. So they're very, They've got lots of money to try and persuade people that this is the right thing to do. And when it clearly fails, they still persuade a lot of people that it's still the right thing to do. The left can never get away with that, which is why any communist state inevitably turns into a fascist dictatorship, or at least a dictatorship, a violence dictatorship, because people don't stand for it. And there's no billionaires like telling people, oh, no, it's fine. All the problems are actually caused by someone 2,000 miles away. Uh, the state shouldn't be running tabletop war games. No, they certainly should not be running tabletop war games. Even though someone told me uh, in uh, like earlier this week that James cleverly plays Warhammer. Didn't know that. Um, I don't mind, you know, he, he, can, he can decide policy on that maybe. Uh, is Labour waiting for Thames water to fall apart before it picks up the pieces? I do hope so. And the rest as well. Uh, would I be in favour of eventually only allowing private enterprise to be workers' cooperatives? No, I, again, I'm not in favour of forcing a model. In the Because you have to be able to adapt. It's like I'm in favour of trialling things out. And if they don't work, you have to accept that they don't work. So what you're talking about, if you only allow this, it's like you're saying we're going to force that. So there shouldn't be a need to force it. Trial it. If it doesn't work, then you abandon it or you refine it. You can refine a model. It might just be that some elements work and some don't. But no, I would never, never implement something just based on pure ideology. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's ideological to say the the state should be running public services because it's really obvious isn't it there is no one can explain to me how a private organization can run say healthcare or housing or education better than the government doing exactly the same thing employing exactly the same people only they don't have to pay shareholders i mean that's really it like whereas Whereas there is an argument for manufacture um, or, you know, some services, I suppose, in the when you talk about innovation. So if you've got a nice, secure, like government job and and you're not necessarily, you know, the, there isn't like a, a system that 
encourages enterprise, then yeah, okay, so you need the enterprise for the innovation, but not in public services. Because that we've had no, what innovation have we had with private water companies? None. What innovation have we had in the NHS as a result from the, the privatised sections of it? None. What, what innovations have we had from the housing, the private housing sector? Bog all. You know, we, we haven't had, and that's what I would say, there are some sectors of the economy where you get genuine innovation and it works out quite well. Like supermarkets, people have a pop at supermarkets. Someone was having a pop at Tesco's profits the other day, making it sound big, and it's like, but it's a percentage, they're actually quite small. The main issue we should have with supermarkets is the fact they're screwing over our farmers. But the reason they're screwing over our farmers is to try and keep food prices low. But, um, but they're not they're not like the, the the piss takers. They're not making ridiculous profits, and that is because they have genuine competition. And because of it, they do innovate. So supermarkets do innovate in a way that we get nothing at all from private water companies, private telecommunications companies. What innovation have we had in this country in the communication, in the private communication sector? Nothing. Not a thing. So it's all bollocks. We don't get a better service for less money. We get a crapper service for more money. We don't get innovation. We don't get anything. Anyway, next one. Uh, we've run out of time. I'll just go through the last few comments. With Labour having regular talks with EU members, would that help in part with rebuilding the military, especially as the EU are moving towards a sort of war economy? Uh, again, hopefully, yes. Hopefully, we're going to have a more Eurocentric attitude towards European defence. We shouldn't be... Real Even if it weren't for Trump, we shouldn't have been relying on America for all this time anyway. It's ridiculous. You could sort of understand it immediately after the Second World War. We should always have been moving towards a point where we understand that America's interests may align somewhere else. Um, so I do hope so. But anyway, we'll have to call it there. Run out of time. Uh, thanks very much for coming on, everyone. Have a very good evening. Next week, we'll probably have a dis more of a discussion on the local elections because they will be upon us. Um, but have a good evening. Until next time, I'll see you later. <laughs>